做啥？你吃完辣椒。We present Tales from Kaitak. On the 6th of July, one of the most challenging airports in the world closes. In this program, we'll talk to the airmen who've made it their profession to fly you safely in and out of Hong Kong's Kaitak International Airport. We'll take you up front onto the flight deck for three landings at Kaitak. A routine landing with British Airways, a simulator training emergency with Northwest, and a real trip round a thunderstorm and hailstones on Cathay Pacific. Tales from Kaitak. My name is David West. I've been flying for 20 years now. Started off in Glasgow at the Glasgow Flying Club, taking flying lessons, and I'm now training captain with Cathay Pacific on Airbus 330 and Airbus 340 aircraft. One day my father came home and he'd been working near the airport and said, uh, I saw a sign that said, uh, learn to fly. Next day I went across, sure enough, one could pay copious amounts of money and uh, take flying lessons, which I did. Here we are 20 years later. Every day you go to work, you take off and quite often come back and land in one of the most demanding airports in the world. The satisfaction of doing it well it is incredible, great job satisfaction to use all your skills, your experience and bring a 747 or a, a large heavy aircraft into land at what is described as one of the most demanding in the world. Autopilot's off. Uh, my name is Tom Erickson, I've been with Northwest Airlines for 32 years. I'm presently a captain on the 747-400. Hong Kong, we kind of weave our way through the mountains there. Rather than going straight at the runway, we come at it at an angle. And then uh, the last half, three quarters of a mile, we make a right-hand turn, turning to the right and landing on the runway. So it's, it's flying almost a little bit reminiscent of back in my Air Force days and flying fighters or that type of airplane where you had a more of an aggressive approach landing to the runway. My name is Chip Crosby. I'm a captain for UPS. I started flying into Hong Kong in the DC-8s originally, and I'm currently flying captain on the 747. The approach starts out in a fairly conventional manner as you join onto the instrument guidance system, which is really very much like an instrument landing system in that it has a left-right course guidance and it has a, a vertical up-down glide slope guidance. You really stick with that until you're in fairly close. From that point on, that's the difference between a regular approach and Hong Kong. Because at that point, down at about a little less than 600 feet above ground, you're required to perform a 47 degree right turn to line up on final. That turn actually doesn't really commence until maybe five to 400 feet above ground. And ground, in this case, is an extremely heavily built up, populated area underneath you with all kinds of lights and everything. And during the, the course of this turn, you're down to just 300 feet, depending on where you get the airplane rolled out wings level. Sometimes you're not wings level until you're almost inside the airport property. That gets interesting. An IGS stands for Instrument Guidance System, and an ILS is an Instrument Landing System. In other words, with an ILS, you can follow that beam right down to the runway whereas an IGS, it's displaced from the runway, and if you uh, followed it all the way down to the ground, you would be in a lot of trouble. My name is Manny Puerta, and I'm a 747 check captain for United Parcel Service, and uh, I've been flying since 1967. The IGS, the Instrument Guidance System, is the fun part about it. I think probably fun is the most descriptive word because in aviation today with the controls that we have and the automation, one can be a passenger in his own airplane, but Hong Kong allows you to actually fly the airplane yourself and provides that self-satisfaction that you don't get at other airports. The sensation on that approach at night in weather is really quite interesting. <laughs> 
as you get close to minimums on the approach, the cockpit starts lighting up with a very eerie orange glow as you fly over the Kowloon Peninsula from all the street lights and everything down below you, which almost, to me, gives you sort of a feeling like you're getting dangerously close to the ground. It's sort of a creepy feeling, in fact. And then breaking out of that approach and trying to make the turn around to that runway in low visibility is very challenging indeed. Barry Schiff. I've been with TWA for 34 years. I've actually been flying since I was 14 years old, or approximately uh, 45 years. I used to fly once around the world, once a month, and it was duty that I thoroughly enjoyed. Everybody wants to do a beautiful job going into Kai Tak. It was uh, such a challenge to do it, and the adrenaline was flowing, so it, it made you more alert to the problems there than perhaps at other airports that were less challenging. You'd fly over the Chung Chow Beacon, low over the South China Sea, and over the windswept waters, and sometimes monsoon or typhoon rain, I should say, heading for a radio beacon, at which point you'd then head toward a, a shallow hill at very low altitude. And the idea was to fly as close to that hill as possible without turning away. And when your co-pilot began to wince and get nervous, that was the time to turn. And uh, you turned sharply toward the runway and you'd land. And the checkerboards were very effective, perhaps even better than radio aids or uh, sophisticated electronics because you couldn't miss them. You saw... 100. 80 knots. I'm Nick Bristow. I'm a captain with British Airways on this 747-400 BA27, London to Hong Kong. We're currently at 33,000 feet and just crossing over Latvia, heading eastward towards Moscow. We'll be passing south of Moscow on our route down to Hong Kong. You really only get one stab at Hong Kong, and when you go around that corner, if you don't line it up correctly, you can get yourself into trouble. It's one of the few airfields that we operate into with this aeroplane where you don't have an opportunity to do an auto land. It's very much a hands-on landing and the conditions can vary so much. The trip that we're on right now will probably do a limits letdown prior to seeing the runway. It just puts your skill to the limit. It's quite unique in terms of the requirements that you need to get into Hong Kong. It's not somewhere where you could really go in without very much experience. You fly low over these concrete canyons and these high-rise buildings, or you feel as though they're probing for your belly. And when the winds are squirrely and turbulent and blowing through these concrete canyons, the turbulence could be very difficult. So it kept you on your toes. We have a decision height that we come down to, at which point, if we are still in cloud or unable to see the runway, we do a go-round. That's to say that we do a missed approach and follow a laid-down procedure and fly clear of the airfield climbing away. My name is Tony Norman. I'm the airport general manager here at Kaitak International Airport. We do have an excellent safety record. I think it's for a number of reasons. First of all, I wouldn't say dangerous, I'd say more spectacular. Certainly from the passenger point of view, as they whistle across the top of Kowloon City. If you look down the right-hand side of the aeroplane, it is very spectacular indeed. And I think a lot of passengers will probably miss this once Kaitak closes. I think it has a good safety record because pilots who go there are prepared. They're very well prepared. They're on their toes. The adrenaline is flowing, and you want to do a really sharp, crisp job. You don't relax. You don't have a chance to screw up the way you might on an approach where you're more complacent. In flying, we're always training. Whether it's a normal flight or whether you're with a training captain or a check captain, you're always learning. You never stop. In fact, the pilot who says he knows it all is the one to stay away from. My name's Terry Marsh, and the only airplane that I've ever flown in there on my own was a 747. I think Hong Kong uh, Kai Tech Airport is one of the most complex airports that I've ever flown in and out of because there's so much that has to be committed to memory or so much information that has to be at your fingertip in a hurry in order to fly it correctly, especially if there is a missed approach that you're not really expecting or uh, maybe an engine failure or something like that. 
and I've uh, worked in the simulator for 10 years now, and that's one of our favorites is to give uh, our students the Hong Kong departure and arrival because it is the most demanding. The simulator is capable of having every emergency up until including actually crash. It makes all the proper noises. It's on a hydraulic system which moves the simulator around, which gives the pilot the seat of the pants feel. My name is Jim Hancock. I'm a pilot for Northwest Airlines. I work in the Northwest Airlines training department. I've worked here for uh, 30 years. My name is Tim Olson. I'm the fleet captain director for the 747-400 and 200 aircraft. Laps up. Laps up. Center autopilot. Center autopilot. You've got ATC. I've got ATC. Uh, engine uh, fire separation severe damage checklist. Number one Northwest Airlines has an emergency checklist in the cockpit which is readily available during any emergency. Northwest Airlines has no memory items, therefore there shouldn't be any mistakes. And it also slows the process down, which is what we're looking for. Five items in the top of the checklist, and this is for every emergency that's on the emergency checklist, is number one, fly the airplane. Number two, silence the oral warning. Number three, identify the emergency. Number four, read the checklist. And the last and probably the most important item is do not hurry. Doing on a two-pilot airplane, we dedicate one person to fly the airplane and talk to the air traffic control people. The other person is dedicated to taking care of the emergency procedure. The only things that they get together on are very important items. When we're shutting an engine down, for instance, we ask the other pilot to confirm that we have the right switch in our hand before we move it. The IGS to 1-3. I'm Dick Duxbury. I'm a retired Northwest captain. The training for captains back in the 80s it was a boondoggle. People would, would ride in in a cockpit because they had to do that before they could fly it as a captain. But it could be just a beautiful, sunshiny day, maybe not a crosswind, not a rain. You go in there and out, and then when you went back to go in yourself, <laughs> with maybe never having anybody else in the crew in there, sure enough, you're going around the horn, Charlie, Charlie, pouring down rain, crosswind landing, and you realize in the left seat, you really don't get a very good view of that runway, particularly if it's raining, until you wind that thing around. And you have to rely on the rest of your crew. I think it's very realistic. People that train in the simulator that I've observed uh, on their first time in Hong Kong uh, using that runway have absolutely no problem. It's uh, practically identical. Our uh, Federal Aviation Administration has designated certain airports as special airports, and Hong Kong, of course, is one of them. When an airport is designated as a special airport, the pilots have to have individualized training for that particular airport, and our simulator has the fidelity that we can do that at Hong Kong. Nothing can substitute for making an actual approach into Kai Tak. It prepares you for what you're going to see and what you have to do. It's a very good procedural trainer, but nothing prepares you for the real thing. Vietnam 790, established on the IES. Vietnam a lot of pilots that I've spoken to have said they do concentrate very hard coming into Kai Tak and make sure they get it right. Controllers in Hong Kong are probably uh, among the best in the world. Their English is very good, they're easy to understand, and they understand the characteristics of the airplane. So they can anticipate maybe problems that you might have in slowing down or speeding up or whatever, or, or having to descend at a higher rate than normal or whatever, because they do understand the characteristics and they, they're very familiar with the Hong Kong area. It's almost a pleasure flying in there compared to other parts of the world. There's a tremendously cosmopolitan atmosphere up there in the control tower, people from all over the world. The training that we do is of a very, very high standard indeed.
The ATC people, for the most part, are in Europe and certainly in the United States, are terrific. Uh, in Japan, I think they're great, but uh, Hong Kong kind of takes maybe a combination of all of them, and I just have never had any problems at all, any criticism of the way we've been handled. Certainly, and they are very professional, very pleasant, a real joy to work with. The coordination of the airspace in this area is a very complex airspace management problem here with aircraft overflying Hong Kong to various other parts of the region, with aircraft coming in from China, going into China, and so on. So the airspace management requires a very, very high degree of skill. And as a result, I think we have a team here which is probably second to none in the whole world. If we ask them, they say no, then what do we do? <laughs> it's an extremely safe airport, statistically. But some of the times there have been problems there in Hong Kong, it's been during the typhoons with a lot of wind across the runway and a lot of rain. When you're doing the, the IGS approach and making that turnaround there, you will often see some wild airspeed fluctuations, tremendous amount of work with the controls to, to keep the airplane coming around. And sometimes you just have to make a missed approach and leave. 74 need to the right turn. Okay, they 7 8 4 is in 4,500 feet. 4,500 and we have to turn right, Kelly 74 to Roger, right, heading 050 to establish local lines and clear for the approach report established. Problems we had this evening was that the weather to the west of the airfield was extremely bad, extremely big thunderstorms, which meant that we had to shorten the approach. It is always the captain's decision as to whether he makes an approach on the landing. He works on the basis of his minima, uh, the company minima, the aircraft minima, of, of course. But as far as we are concerned as an airport operator, the airport is maintained open and operational throughout. When we're asking for certain headings to avoid the weather, it gives the controller a lot of problems. He still has to separate the aircraft. In any case, we've still got to avoid the extreme weather. It's like a partnership. We know his problems. He's busy. He's under pressure. And to a certain extent, we are too. Part of the planning for this evening is the preparation for the physical guiding of the aircraft to the runway. But there are wider aspects, such as if the weather is so bad at Kai Tak, where are we going to go? Where are we going to land? We must always have an alternate. Weather frequently is an issue, it's, uh, particularly in the summertime. It's a, it's a semi-tropical area. There's these uh, puffy buildups here and there, and you can have good weather one minute, and five minutes later you can have a, a downpour, and then ten minutes after that it's all gone. When we got below the cloud, around 1,500 feet, the panorama opens up where you've got Hong Kong Island to the right, Kowloon Peninsula in front of you. Uh, but obviously it was raining rather hard this evening, so visibility is still limited. And when we make the visual turn from the decision altitude, uh, where we've got to make the decision, are we visual or not, can we land on the runway or not, we need all the visual clues we can get. There's a purely visual, manual, seat of the pants, right turn, some 48 degrees at very low level, five, 600 feet. And that requires good visibility, and rain is one of our biggest problems here. wind coming from the north through to the east and then as we completed the turn lined up at the runway it went to a southeasterly direction and once again just in the last couple hundred feet gave him a crosswind of some 15 knots all those changes require thrust changes bank angle changes pitch attitude changes it's all happening it's basically done without thought it's not conscious thought it's a bit like driving the car you don't say i'm I'm going to turn this corner, it just seems to happen. And it's the same with, with pilots, but it does take a lot of experience, a lot of skill, and really, this is a place to get back to basics. But this time, or in Hong Kong, you're doing it with a wide body jet. My name is Ralph Riqua. I've been flying airplanes since about 1959 and commercially since 63. The weather can always surprise you in Hong Kong. We had uh, been cleared for the IGS, or the stone cutter approach, to land on 1-3, and uh, the weather had been reported as quite decent, not, nothing uh, spectacular. 
about um, halfway down the IGS, were given a report of deteriorating weather and heavy rain. And about that time, we ran into one tremendous rainstorm. I liken it to like to trying to look down a uh, fire hose. It was just one tremendous amount of water. The DC-8 doesn't have windshield wipers. It has a system of compressed air off the engines blown onto the windshield to remove the rain and snow. This system works fairly well, and in this case it was working, but we had an area of about oh, 8 inches by 4 inches on the windshield to see out on each side. I can remember getting down towards the point where we had to make the turn to line up with the runway, and uh, I was getting a little bit nervous, so I said, told the cat, I think you better turn now, and he started his turn. Now, I like to believe that he he was going to turn there anyway. Randy Sohn, and the first time I flew on it started in 1959 with VIP C-54s from the States. The first flight I had the uh, director of fighter operations for USAF on board is General Gordy Graham on an inspection tour of the Far East out of the uh, headquarters of the Pentagon. For the first flight into Hong Kong, I didn't get into Hong Kong. We started the approach and we were very nervous about the Chinese communists broadcasting on the same frequency. We ran the approach into the harbor and never did break out of the bottom of the overcast. I could see straight down in the water and we started getting increasingly nervous because we neither one of us had ever been in there in our lives and with all the wheels in the back we didn't like this too good and I finally told the general I said I think we're going to be in Manila tonight which we did we pulled up missed approach and went back to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. An airship with a 250-ton airplane it's a bit like trying to turn a, an ocean-going liner a few degrees. It takes a while to turn and so forth. And all that lag and lead has got to be catered for, as well as the change in the ambient conditions. It's, to say, very demanding. And that gives us great job satisfaction when it goes well. For me, it's one of the last of the really sort of neat airports to fly into with a big airplane. A lot of times I sat there and thought, I wonder what this looks like from the ground, if they're having as much fun with me over their head as I'm sitting there 300 feet or 200 feet going around the apartment building in the Kai Tech and thinking I have to make this work. I just looked at the other day. I've done it 110 times. It still, to me, is just fascinating to do. I don't know why. It's probably hard to describe and hard to understand for a non-pilot, but... There's something about running a big airplane around that tight corner there and everything, and, and making it work out nicely. Nowhere in the world is there an airport like this, particularly an airport of this size. So it is a very unique place, and I think the people, the business people, just across the road in Kowloon City will miss the airport as much as the airport people will miss Kowloon City. In my mind, I like Hong Kong and I like Washington National because they give you an opportunity to fly the airplane as we would as a crop duster. To me, it's going to be a loss of freedom, the freedom to fly the airplane close to the ground like that and actually fly it, not let the autopilot do it and uh, the challenge of making the approach properly and dealing with the wind, etc. That, that's the part that I'm going to miss. One of particular uh, note is a warning. It says, continued flight on the instrument guidance system flight path after passing the MM or middle marker, which is a fix about 2.2 uh, miles from the uh, runway, will result in loss of terrain clearance. Translated in uh, layman's terms, that means you will fly into a mountain. There's not a lot of fly-by-night outfits into Hong Kong. I'd, I'd hate to have Miami, Florida be looking like Hong Kong because I think you would have airplanes stuck all over the mountains. Just my guess. <laughs> it is a piece of history. It's, it's something that we'll probably never see again. It's a, a real special airport, and I'm really going to miss it.
reason, is, isn't it? Well, yeah. very, very lucky with the, uh, the wind, I think. Yes, I think you've done that before, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very smooth, Nick. Only one I'd expect. <laughs>